Before we get started with our rather quick discussion of VTP, let's remind ourselves why we're VTPing in the first place. I wanted to show you this illustration again from the last video because it brings up two scenarios we have to be aware of. One of them, of course, we talked about was filtering VLANs. It looks like a great idea to filter VLAN 30 traffic going from this switch to this one until we saw this one added to the network. We can't filter VLAN 30 traffic going across this trunk because then this switch would never get it. Another thing we have to be concerned about is letting these middle switches know about the existence of VLANs that they themselves are not members of. They have no ports in those VLANs. The problem would be then, if you didn't do that somehow, if this switch sent uh, excuse me, uh, frames destined for VLAN 30 and sent them to this switch, which has hosts in VLAN 20 only, that switch is just going to look at that frame and say, I don't know VLAN 30 from a hole in the ground. You know, I'm just going to dump these. There's no reason for me to send them out any of my other trunks. So we've got to have some way of letting all of our switches in our network know about all the VLANs in our network. And we're going to do that with the VLAN trunking protocol. As I mentioned, we're not going into a tremendous amount of detail here on VTP. For one thing, there isn't a lot of tremendous detail, which you'll probably be glad to hear. I'm going to give you enough information to make you dangerous. And it's my job to make you dangerous for the exam. This will certainly help you do that. But there's also something in VTP that you need to know about that can literally be dangerous to a production network. So once we're done going over the theory here and one or two commands on the live equipment, I want to spend a few minutes with you on that because that is vital information for you to have. Now again, VTP just allows our switches to have a consistent view of the switch network because it allows switches to advertise VLAN information between other members of the same VTP domain, hint, 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 hint. That's really important. VTP is not on by default, and when you start it on a switch, the first thing you've got to do is define the domain. I mentioned this on the next screen as well, but that name is case sensitive. You really got to watch that. Lowercase ccna, uppercase ccna, two separate VTP domains. We have summary advertisements with VTP. There's not a tremendous amount of overhead because a VTP server is only going to send one of those advertisements every five minutes. And it will also do so immediately when there's a change in the VTP database, when it finds out that a, VT, uh, excuse me, a VLAN has been deleted or added, something like that. Now notice I said a VTP server. We actually have three different modes. The first one is server mode. VLANs can be created, modified, and deleted in server mode. And by modified, mostly we mean you can name it. Um, when these actions are taken, the changes are advertised to all switches in the VTP domain. And again, VTP servers can originate, forward, and process those summary advertisements. VTP keeps VLAN information on a reboot by storing that info in non-volatile RAM, NVRAM. That's an important real-world point. Because in client mode, the switch cannot modify, create, or delete VLANs. Now, by modify, we don't mean add a port to a VLAN. Because if on a client, if we couldn't add a port to a VLAN, then we'd be in a lot of trouble. Now, VTP clients don't retain the VLAN config information on a reload because they keep the information in the running config, but not in NVRAM. So a big difference there. If a VTP client is reloaded, it must reobtain that information from a server when it comes back up. It's usually, you know, no problem at all usually. Now switches in transparent mode forward the VTP advertisements received from other switches, but they don't process the information contained in those ads. VLANs can be created, deleted, and modified on a transparent VTP device, but those changes are not advertised to the other switches in the domain. They're locally significant only. So I like invisible mode better, but <laughs> transparent is good too, because that's what happens. You know, the advertisements go through them like they're not there. And when you make changes on the transparent VTP device, uh, they're not advertised to other switches. And again, transparent VTP switches, by the way, keep their VLAN info in NVRAM just as servers do. Just a couple of quick reminders here uh, and a couple of commands we'll see live. As far as the VTP fundamentals go that we need to remember, you set that domain with the VTP domain command that is case sensitive. And if you see an odd sentence that says changing from null to CSENT or whatever you call it, 
Uh, that just simply indicates there was no previous domain name. I've seen people freak out mildly just a little bit over that, so I want to let you know about that one. We're going to set that mode with the VTP mode command, and again, to distribute information about a newly created VLAN, the switch upon which that VLAN is created must be in server mode. You also cannot build a VTP domain with only VTP clients. You do not want to do that, and we're about to see why. Let's go ahead and bring the live equipment up here. And I'm just going to play around with VTP just a little bit here. First off, let's do a set VTP. Well, I was going back in time there. Let's try this one. VTP domain. It's just the ASCII name for the VTP advertising domain. Administrative domain. We'll call it CCNA. I had it set to CCNP. So no problems there. And let's run a quick show VTP status. This is really the show command for VTP. As you can see, this is not a complex protocol at all. It's not something that you, de that you even debug. You rarely need to do that. I am running version 2 on this particular switch. There is a VTP version 3 that has some cryptographic properties. It actually allows you to hide a password you can set because version 2, unbelievably, does not allow you to do that. Uh, but 2 is fine for our practice because what I really want to show you is this configuration revision number. This is very important. Notice it's at zero right now. And with the other information here, you see we've got seven existing VLANs, operating mode server, domain name CCNA, everything else, V2 mode and pruning mode we're going to save for future studies. So right now, let's just go ahead and create a VLAN and see what happens. I'm going to do it in an odd way, but just with VLAN 233. And I'm going to save that, do a show VTP status. So I'm going to save that. Let's see what happens. Notice this configuration revision number went up to 1. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So I've created a VLAN successfully. You see the configuration revision number went up. And now I'm going to make this into a client. There are the three choices. We're going with client this time. And now, let's create another VLAN. And you see that you can't do that. You are going to get a message explaining to you the VTP VLAN configuration not allowed when device is in client mode. So it can lead to an odd scenario where you could have, say, a switch that was a client and for some reason you couldn't change it. And if that's going to be the only switch with ports in the VLAN, you would actually have to go to a server and create the VLAN somewhere else and then come back and put ports in the VLAN on that client switch. It's, it's a little bizarre, I grant you that. Uh, it's not a real world situation you're going to run into very often. But let's go ahead and change that back because I'm about to tell you about a real world situation you will run into sooner or later. So I've set it back to server. I'm going to create another VLAN. And you'll notice that configuration revision number went up. In a nutshell, here's what that is. It is a way for the switch to tell if it has the latest information on VLANs or if an advertisement that's being received from another switch is more recent than the information the local switch has. And what happens is there's just a quick comparison of the configuration revision number. And if, it is, if the configuration revision number is higher on the incoming advertisement than it is the one set on the local switch, that advertisement is accepted and it's used to overwrite the local switch's VTP VLAN information. If an advertisement comes in and the config revision number is lower than the local configuration revision number, then the switch says, okay, the information I have is much more recent or more recent, therefore I'm going to ignore this incoming advertisement. Sounds pretty innocent, right? Right, except this happens more than once. You may have done this yourself because you're, you're let's say that you work for a consulting firm and they have been nice enough to put together a practice lab for you at their site. It could be CCNA lab, a couple switches in it, CCNP lab, CC, uh, CCIE lab, doesn't matter. It's got some switches in it. 
Well, sooner or later, you're going to have a client that, say, uh, loses a switch and it's a vital piece of equipment and there's no new ones sitting around anywhere. So at that point, your firm is just desperate to find a switch somewhere, desperate enough to start asking their own people, you know, do you have a switch at home in your lab we could use? And I'm not kidding. This has happened. Well, I guarantee you that if you have a rack of nice Cisco practice equipment sitting in the corner, and a client needs a piece out of that rack, it's coming out of that rack. <laughs> it's, uh, practice rack does not come before clients. So what can happen is that someone just rips a switch right out of that rack, takes it to the client site, puts it in, and everything is just beautiful. Okay, that could happen. As a matter of fact, it is a real world situation. I've, had it happen, I've seen it happen more than once. But here's something you have to be extremely careful about. Of course, the odds that your practice rack is using the exact same VLANs as your client is very, very low. So if you take a switch from a CCIE or CCNA practice rack that has a configuration or vision number set to 700 because it's been worked on a lot and you've created a lot of different VLANs and you've deleted a lot of VLANs, etc., and you take it to a network and you slap it in there with a bunch of switches with configuration revision number 50 or anything below that, below uh, the new switch's number, oh man, you see what happens. That new switch that came out of the practice rack, its advertisements are going to be accepted by all of the other switches in that network because they're going to say, oh, I don't know what's going on, but I just got an advertisement with a revision number that's a lot higher than mine, so I'm going to take that switch's information and overwrite it and overwrite my VLAN database. And oh man, you're not, it's not gonna take you long to find out that happened. It's just an agonizing thing, because of course now you've gotta get your client's entire switch network back to its original VLAN uh, configuration. So I'm glad I could give you the theoretical knowledge behind this, that's good stuff to know for your exam. But with VTP, this is something you gotta know. You've got to reset this config revision number to zero when you are taking a new switch, an old switch, or any kind of switch and putting it into a client site. If it's a new switch, I mean, I mean straight out of the box, you're seeing it come out of the box, etc. That's beautiful. But if you're taking, you know, you could just take it from another client network, you know, uh, I would ask them. But it doesn't matter where it comes from. If it's been in a network, practice or otherwise, you need to nuke that config revision number down to zero. Now, it is not necessarily as easy as doing a write erase. Unfortunately, we have to draw the line somewhere, uh, and I can't go into all the details of how you knock that revision number down. But Cisco's got a couple of best practices you can find very quickly. So if you want to do a little extra homework, I think that's a great idea. But if you are ever taking a practice lab switch and putting it in a production no network, that is homework that you really need to do. That concludes our discussion of VTP, both uh, theoretical and real world. I'll see you on the next video, and we'll wrap this section up.